Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this webinar all about, uh, we're all part of the New Era for Stroke program led by the Stroke Association. Uh, and today we're focusing on rehabilitation and data. Uh, my name is Richard Torn from Kaleidoscope. I'm Helen Southwell from the Stroke Association. My name's Lydia from Kaleidoscope. Uh, and we're coming to you uh, live from a uh, very sunny Surrey Keys in South East London. Uh, I'm fantastic to be joined by Sarah and Tracy in Salford, which is equally sunny. Yes, slightly. <laughs> Hi. Are there, any, are there any windows in your room? By the looks of it, it sort of seems a bit like a padded cell. I'm assuming it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit depressing. It's better than the other one that's got no windows at all. So yes. So I'm <coughs> I'm Sarah Rickard. I'm Tracy Walker. I'm the clinical lead for the ODN, and I manage rehabilitation services in North Manchester. Lovely, so Tracy. Thank you so much for joining, uh, and thank you everyone on. Uh, on the line for giving up an hour of the afternoon uh, to uh, be with us today. Uh, just in case you're wondering what is this thing which you've joined in, uh, well today we're going to be talking about how data can support change across the region. Uh, we've got a fantastic example uh, from uh, with uh, Tracy and Sarah talking about what's been happening in lived experience. Also the chance to link in with national mm -hmm. work and an opportunity to ask questions, challenge thinking. So hopefully that is in line with what you're hoping to get today. Uh, if you joined our webinar uh, yesterday uh, with Deb Lowe uh, and Jen Gardner, uh, uh, welcome back, and Alexis, of course. I uh, hope you enjoyed that one. If it's your first time, you are very welcome too. If you did join yesterday, you'll know that uh, over the next hour, it's going to be a mix of presentations. Uh, you're going to hear from uh, Helen, Sarah, and Tracy, uh, but also we'd love your input as we go through. There are three ways you can do that. Uh, you can use the Ask Question feature uh, on GoToWebinar. It's one little question mark. Uh, if that's finding, if that's a bit tricky to find, don't hesitate to email us. That email address is hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare on your screens. Uh, and of course, please do feel free to tweet as we go through. Uh, the hashtag is New Era Stroke. Uh, which always reminds me of some sort of 80s band, but New Era Stroke is the hashtag, uh, or the Twitter handle is at Kscope Help. Uh, we are recording today's session. Uh, you might well be watching back at a later date. Uh, um, welcome to you from the future, if so. Uh, so if your IT crashes halfway through, do not worry. Uh, we'll be circulating the, the finished product uh, uh, at the end of the call. Uh, so I think just to just to check that everyone, uh, those methods are uh, of use and people can get in touch, what would be lovely is, uh, just as we did in the webinar yesterday, uh, if um, everyone joining on the line could just send us a very quick email, very quick email just, and put in the subject line, uh, well, firstly, a weather report. Are you are you joining from somewhere equally sunny? Uh, a weather report, uh, but particularly uh, why you've why you've joined today? What are you looking to get out of it? So, if you could email us, uh, so putting in the subject line, uh, weather report, uh, but also why you're joining us today. Send that through to hello at closescope uh, We'll anonymize more. Don't worry about that. But it'd be great just to get a flavour of why people are joining today uh, as we said uh, likewise because you're in the same team as Helen and Helen's asked you to join is a perfectly legitimate reason uh, that is absolutely fine but if you want to do that just quickly before we get going that would be lovely thank you and we'll come to those in due course uh, so just a reminder of who you've, who you've got here today so it's myself Lydia and Helen here in London Sarah and Tracy uh, up in Salford uh, and if you're just wondering who on earth Kaleidoscope is, so we are social enterprise working with the Stroke Association to support uh, today's webinar. Our focus is about how you can have constructive conversations across boundaries, of which we think this is a fantastic example. So, without further ado, Helen, should we uh, crack on? Yeah, that's what, fine. What, what's yes. all this about then? Hi, uh, hi. My name's Helen. Um, I work for the Stroke Association. Um, just a few words uh, around our work and also um, some of the, the work that we're doing nationally around stroke. So the coming slides will hopefully introduce that to you. Just to say that the charity, the Stroke Association, is one, is the leading national stroke charity um, in the UK. And we're concerned with stroke prevention, we're concerned with research, and we're concerned with providing care support services for people following stroke. So we're in the business of, of supporting um, all those families and um, stroke survivors um, that have had a stroke. So um, part of the um, 
the role we have is supporting stroke survivors and we have launched the new area for stroke and this is in response to a phenomenal piece of research that showed that 45 percent of all stroke survivors feel abandoned when they leave hospital um which is a huge a huge amount of people that um clearly there's a huge variation in in what happens between being in hospital and when they're discharged going home and this is really why the new era for stroke campaign started two years ago and has subsequently led to the government and nhs england now committing to developing an improvement plan for stroke and this is now being launched as a clinical priority um, with a national team and hopefully it will be, be set out within the, the long-term plan as a clinical priority uh, shortly. So this has really um, led to the establishment of a national stroke programme and the Stroke Association has been working in partnership with NHS England right from the onset here. Our chief exec officer is a co-chair of the National Stroke Programme Board um, and we've been involved at all levels here. I don't know whether the slide's that clear for viewers, but what there is there is a structure that shows a number of working groups set out underneath the national programme. Um, and the one of particular interest for today is the working group around rehabilitation and long-term support. And this is chaired by Professor Helen Rogers. And within that group, there are a number of ambitions, actually in fact, six ambitions. And one of them is around um, early supported discharge and community rehab. So particularly important for um, um, uh, bringing about best practice, getting the, the evidence out there and working with, with the, the key clinicians and um, healthcare professionals to really improve this, this, this area of the pathway. There's also a strong connection with data. Um, one of the working groups nationally is about data and research. And this is about supporting the programme in terms of improving access to the right information and up to date information to support service improvements. So a, a good link there with the national programme. So what we're doing locally as, as the Stroke Association is we don't necessarily just want to be involved nationally. Actually, we want to be part of the solution locally. And we are very keen to work with local areas to partner um, to improve stroke services. And actually, what we want to be is a constructive partner, a partner that can help systems overcome challenges. Um, the NHS footprint now, NHS and social care footprint is, is evolving uh, around integrated care systems, an absolute opportunity here to, to really exemplify stroke, stroke, stroke integration through, through the vehicle of an integrated care system. And we're very keen to work with, the, work with systems as partners. Um, and, and that is, 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 a, is a big part of the work we're doing. We launched um, a, a national community of, of best practice back in our October. And this is really how these webinars have come about today um, to really get colleagues talking to each other and sharing best practice. And what came out of that session on the 2nd of October were a number of areas where webinars were, were put for suggested for a number of subjects suggested for webinars and we had one yesterday that was around the six month review and beyond and there is a link I think on the web on the screen here if you want to look at the video recording of it um, looking at different models and today uh, we have data and these were the two uh, webinar two areas voted uh, as priority for the first webinars and we're looking to do more in 2019 so if you have ideas and you want specific topics to be looked at take a deep dive into then we're willing to help facilitate that um, in a similar way the other thing is what we're doing is if you're interested in taking part in the network or being involved in, in learning and being linked into the network, please let us know even by emailing us here or through Twitter or through the email that um, Richard has mentioned. Um, and we're putting together a steering group um, to really try and understand the purpose of the network. And if you'd like to be involved in shaping what the network looks like, equally get in touch. That'd be fantastic. Um, Final slide, I think Richard's probably set out the scene for today, but what, what you're gonna gain from today is, 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 is a model of community rehab uh, for Greater Manchester as one example, but also how important data is captured or how it's going to be, how it's driving improvements. So we'd encourage you to share challenges and successes, hear about how they fit into the national piece and what work's going on nationally, but clearly an opportunity to ask questions and also challenge local thinking if you're struggling within your local system. It may come up with some ideas that you could share with colleagues, um, signpost, or even had some contacts here today that you could reach out to. So I hope you enjoy and um, I'll pass over to 
the next, I think it's the next speaker now, which is Nick. Yeah. Helen, thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Really nice uh, run through. Uh, we're going to come to Lydia for a weather report in just a second. Uh, but before we do, um, Helen, you sort of you mentioned the work about sort of developing this sort of community to share their best practice. I've got the webinar today, webinar yesterday. Um, it, it, is this just for Christmas? Uh, or is this something that the association is going to be doing into 2019 and, and beyond? No, absolutely not just for Christmas. The work's been going on for the last two years um, to get us to this point. And actually, I think the exciting part starts now. Um, the Stroke Association um, is in a really privileged position with the partnership we have with NHS England. And we're starting to have exploratory conversations with many of the ICS areas um, across the country. Um, and what we're looking to support is, a, is an offer of support with um, uh, integrated care systems around parts of the pathway that they're struggling with and rehabilitation is one area that you know we're well versed in supporting from a quality improvement perspective from um, sharing best practice perspective and all, all really importantly is about you know we represent the patient voice and actually that's really important when you're redesigning services is that you don't forget that the patient center um, so we're a strong advocate of that as well. So yeah, the journey will continue. I think it's kind of like the start of the exciting bit now because it's about doing <laughs> and delivering. <laughs> uh, and lovely, thank you very much. So if you're joining the webinar thinking, great, in 60 minutes, I will have all the answers <laughs> and then it will all be solved. Um, firstly, uh, well done to your optimism. Uh, but secondly, uh, we hope you do bear with us uh, as we sort of build this community into the new year. We'll come to Sarah and Tracy in one second, but Lydia, why are people joining? Um, and most importantly, where's, what's the weather like? Well, it seems to be pretty good all over. We've got people coming, tuning in from Nottingham, from Berkshire, from a train. Um, good. <laughs> and it's a resounding sunny but nippy. Sunny but nippy, lovely. And uh, why are people joining? Um, so a range, really. There's um, a physio who's joined um, as part of an ESD team and is keen to look at what the future plans are for monitoring and facilitating stroke rehabilitation. Uh, there's lots of change happening in Scotland. This is the person on the train Great. Uh, and want to hear the latest from the Manchester team. And then finally, uh, we want to know more about data capture for quality indicators in the future. And um, there is a, another person that feels it's very important to keep up with the latest developments. Lovely, thank you very much. And thank you again, everyone, for joining. Um, and we should say well done to whoever's joining on the train, either for having good phone signal or there being good Wi-Fi uh, <laughs> on your train. Thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, lovely, so we'll, we'll move straight on. Uh, so, if you joined yesterday's webinar, um, you'll already have been introduced to Sarah Rickard from Greater Manchester because Sarah, you asked a whole range of excellent questions yesterday. Uh, I didn't so, uh, Tracy, thanks so much for joining to talk about particularly the work that's been going on in Greater Manchester. Over to you. Uh, lovely. So, if you perhaps want to move on to the um, to the first slide. Um, so the work we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the first little bit of it, which is focused about just about what we've been doing. And then Trace is going to talk a bit in, in quite a bit of detail around actually how we've used the data to drive that change and how we'll be using it in the future to drive change. So, so my bit is just to really give you a, bit, a brief overview of the work we've been doing in community rehabilitation transformation. And then I'll hand over to Tracy to talk about the data stuff in a bit more detail. Um, we did present some of this at the UKSF last week, so apologies if you were there, but um, perhaps gives you an, another opportunity to ask us some questions at the end or, or during. So um, we've been um, working on our community transformation since 2016, and you may well be aware from um, some of my whistle-stop tours around the country or giving talks on our acute pathway transformation. Um, we, we transformed the inpatient service um, fully in 2015, um, and we now have a kind of a, a, an A-rated um, care pathway according to according to SNAP. So that's go gone really well, but not without its challenges, but, but broadly speaking, we've achieved that. But what we then have is a situation where patients get A-rated care when they're in hospital, but obviously when they go home, they enter a, a postcode lottery and potentially their care varies hugely depending on where they live. Um, so they can be getting A-rated care in hospital um, and then going home to perhaps G-rated care, which is obviously um, 
uh, unacceptable. Um, and it's also been a, quite a powerful message to the commissioners to say, well, you invested in the community, but into the inpatient pathway, and we've achieved this. That's great. But potentially, all that money is being wasted by by people going home to poor rehabilitation. So um, we've been working on 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 this particular aspect of the care pathway to make sure that both are are equally good. Um, next slide. So unless you are familiar with the um, the the centre of the universe that is um, Greater Manchester, then this is what we look like. And we have nine stroke units. Um, we span 11 clinical commissioning groups, which are fortunately fairly coterminous with our local authorities. And we're all part of the devolution um, uh, package. So most of that conurbation falls within uh, what we would be equivalent of our STP. So we're quite a nice defined urban geography that's used to working well together. We've got a mayor, we've got um, all sorts of things that are very much Greater Manchester focused. So um, we've got within those 11 CCGs, 17 separate specialist community neuro rehabilitation teams. So 17 different teams. And it vary varies per CCG to have previously not really had any service and the others have ranged from having one team through to three teams. Um, the area I live in has in Trafford has three community teams serving a, a very complex pathway. Um, so within those teams we've got four different models of care um, so there isn't any um, equity in that um, and that's diff those differences that variation is leading to, to, to the postcode lottery that we have so we've got inequitable access to services um, often we've got inadequate staffing um, in the teams and, and often the um, we, we may not have all the professional groups represented in the team so for example psychologists and nurses are, are often not re well represented. Um, the models, particularly those that have an ESD model and perhaps a community neuro rehab team, uh, are often inefficient, so there may be huge delays from leaving one service to accessing another, um, coupled with um, obviously the poor patient experience of being handed on between teams. So we've often got waiting lists, particularly where there's the more traditional sort of CNRT model in place. Um, and that, as that's knocking on sometimes to leaving to longer lengths of stay in hospital because people can't be discharged because the, um, there are delays accessing community services. So um, our, um, our snapshot when we looked at this in 2016 was basically lots of variation and some, some areas were delivering a good service, but generally speaking, it wasn't good enough. And in some areas, the services were very, very poor. So um, we've been working to transform that so that we have a, a single standard uh, specification as we do for the acute pathway so that everybody, broadly speaking, receives the same quality of care for community rehabilitation, regardless of where you live in, in our different um, 11 different areas. Um, next slide, please. So um, there's not going to be a test on this. Don't worry, it's quite complicated. So the, the work we did was initially, and, and it was led by Tracy um, uh, and, and born out of some other work, really. Um, looking at developing a single set service specification and model. So the diagram you can see in front of you is a, a, a uh, representation um, behind it is a, as a longer, more detailed service specification. Um, and within that, it, it effectively outlines who should be in the core team, um, what staff should be in the core team, and then what services should be wrapped around that. And then it, it defines really the care pathway. So whether you're discharged from hospital or whether you're a, a community referral, um, it, it really outlines the different care pathways that you might follow. So one of those will be with just support from the community team. The, the second pathway would involve community team and reablement and the third pathway. And quite critically, um, this is important because a lot of patients don't get access in care homes. It actually said it, it defines that care homes are also um, part of the pathway. And so if you're in a care home, you don't get excluded from receiving specialist care so people would in reach into your um, into your facility so we, the, the three pathways really talk about what should happen when it should happen and um, how frequently it should happen and give some broad principles about um, actually what should be delivered um, wrapped around that is the access to the voluntary sector and other support services that are needed and then also the, the model talks about the six-month review um, and and the discharge process um, it talks around in, and, and, and the model is based on the ESD evidence that we have which is is quite old but there's nothing in there that is not 
incompatible with ESD and it includes the, the evidence that we have for the ESD patients and also for the non-ESD ESD patients. So where possible it is evidence based on what we know from early supported discharge but we've also used local clinical consensus um, to, to fill the gaps in if you like because one of the problems we have is that the lack of research evidence for um, different models of care and also um, for um, different aspects of community rehabilitation. So that's a model um, and that's what we're trying to implement. Oh, that's not, not what we're trying. That is what we are implemented um, across all of our 11 different areas. Um, so next slide, please. Sorry, just before we go on, there's huge amount yes. of uh, detail on this slide, which is fantastic. Yes. Are we OK to share the slides for people who want to? All of that, yeah, all of the information actually um, on our website. If you if you register at the top right hand corner, um, you get accesses, access to the resources toolbar. And on it is on the community rehabilitation is the service specification. Um, it's important to note that we've, we've doing this work in conjunction with neuro rehabilitation because the community aspect, there's a lot of overlap. And there's a similar service specification for community neuro rehab as well. So the two can be run together within a single service, um, either with two teams teams or with one so yeah people can have a, we've widely shared this it's not a huge state secret we'd, we'd love people to um to implement it Lovely. so no, the, point of, uh, the point of this particular specification is that it's um it's all patients receive um, a particular standard of care it's not divided into whether you're esd or not esd it, it outlines that everybody exiting a, a stroke unit or being referred in from community should have access to specialist support so thank Sorry, you so what well, technical note? No, 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 absolutely fine. Uh, it's if you're joining live, there is a handout tab on GoToWebinar, which if you go to now, uh, you'll be able to download those slides and be able to look at it in, in great detail. Uh, if you're joining later, uh, I want a copy of the slides. Don't hesitate to email us. Hello at Clydescope.help. <coughs> those straight on uh, Sarah apologies we will move on no, that's fine so so just so to recap then um, we're implementing the, the single service specification across all our areas um, which involves transformation in some areas from having no service so they've commissioned that from the from the start um, and in other areas looking at what existing teams have they've got and then using um, the service specification to uh, effectively fill the gaps or make transformation of the teams um, so how have we done this and this is the kind of magic bit this is the bit I get kind of people say there's no money it can't be done it can't be done um, it can be done because we, we're doing it and Greater Manchester is not particularly special um, in some ways we haven't got we haven't got different commissioners we haven't got more money um, but what we do have is, is a number of things that I think of, of, of have lent themselves to making this happen. Um, I'll just quickly run through them, but the most important one we're going to talk about today is about data driving change, but I'll just touch on the rest. So um, we've won hearts and minds, so that's around having good acute care but poor community. We've done a lot of work messaging around how poor community services are and using stroke survivor stories to kind of highlight that. Um, we've highlighted what the problem is, but we've also offered the solution, which is our um, service specification and model. Um, we've used our health and social care partnership, which is our STP, to, to lever at an executive level change. So to lever CCGs at executive level to make them effectively um, come up with the money. Um, we've identified as part of that influencing key decision makers and we've lobbied them since two this has not just happened it's we've been going at this nearly three years now so it's not sudden change but we've we've lobbied persistently um for this to happen um we've worked with our neuro rehab colleagues we've broadened it out so it's not just stroke um that's quite an important message often the teams are similar so they can be bound up together um, we've not given up but we've been realistic about the time frames i naively thought this was going to take a year and um it's not it's taken longer than that um Really important, and I'm going to look at Tracy here. We've had really effective clinical leadership, and I can't tell you how important it has been to have a AHP, Tracy's an OT, as a clinical leader who actually walks the walk and actually lives and breathes running a community neuro rehab service herself um, and has experienced a transformation. So, one of the things that you absolutely need to help drive transformation is a credible clinical lead who ideally is, well, actually is not a doctor. Um, this is a therapy led service, and you need therapists to help lead that. Um, and it is possible to get commissioners to fund it. They do have money. It's about making sure that it's um, a priority. Um, so I'm going to finish up. We've had this is a number of things that we've used to drive the change. And actually, so but one of the things is about having evidence and having data. It's very well going to commissioners and saying your services are a bit rubbish, but actually you need to have data to help prove that and to help show them how they're performing worse or better than their neighbours, which is often quite an effective way of driving change. So I'm going to pass over to Tracy, who's going to talk about the data side of things. Okay, so next slide, please. 
So basically, as Sarah's talked about, we did have an, when I came into post and joined the meetings around this transformation, the acute was um, an excellent service. They had the graphs in these meetings with all the people who um, funded the services to say how well or not well they were doing. And I realized very quickly without that simple dashboard, um, to have the conversations about community, we were never going to move because um, we weren't able to verbalize what actually was the problem. So things like how we're going to show what our community looks like, um, what actually are our models, what are we doing, and how does that, what does that mean for a patient? So in terms of impact in the different areas, and also for me, how we're going to hold commissioners to account for. Uh, what their area looks like an investment so basically for me it was we spent the last two years developing a dashboard um, which has really helped drive our um, transformation forward um, and, and enable us to have kind of rag ratings for the different elements so if you move i'm going to talk about four different key the, the dashboard uh, we can share with you um, after got lots of different things in but I've pulled out four key elements that I think um, or kind of get the point across of how we've managed to use it to with our transformation so next slide so this one here as I said we've got a big excel dashboard one of the key things for me was how I, I'm going to talk in the ODN with the commissioners about their area so it's looking at the model and profiling so this is for me is a bit of, of, of the dashboard is around commissioning and, and what the team actually looks like so we've the different things i'll go through um and also it's about the transformation progress so with this i am able to say where commissioners are in their transformation we've got a key from a to e so a means that because uh, we've now got obviously the model and the service vector work towards all the commissioners that agree to that so it's right, okay, so where are we in terms of your transformation to get to that point? So if you're in E, in red, like on, this is just an example. So each area a team across GM is listed across on our dashboard there with all the information. So if you've got no action plan um, towards transformation, you would be in E and it can rate up to where you can be scoping a business plan out. So you'd move up a scale, you could be business case approved and you're in the implementation phase right up to where you've got the model and it's working and implemented so you could really see where the different areas are at with regards to the model of de delivery like sarah said across gm we had four different you can read about this there's a document called commissioning for stroke improvement that i helped write with um, nhs stroke improvement a few years back and in there, it details the different models of how ESD was implemented. And it ranges from one to five models. You could be an ESD team um, standalone with no other rehabilitation, or you could be an ESD team who passes on to a neuro team. So there's different models. And the model we're advocating in Manchester was one team, either stroke or a neuro team, who delivered rehabilitation for all patients coming out of hospital in the community which helps get over the problems with implementing ESD on its own. Other things on there, we've got um, profiling how many referrals each of the teams got. So, and then we could start look at population sizes. So we can guesstimate now based on a population size, how many people you can ex uh, expect referrals from the community and from the hospital. So it helps with the business modeling with commissioners. And also the range of uh, people they see uh, with regards to the modified ranking, uh, you know, how, how impaired the patients these teams are seeing, how complex and the average length of stay in days. So you, you can make assumptions. You are receiving very complex patients, but your average length of stay that you're able to keep these patients for is 32 days. So you can start to see gaps already. So to the next slide. So this here, so that was about commissioning what the team looks like. And this is for me is around the model that we just showed you. Um, it, this measures your compliance in each area with proposed model. 
So I picked out 16 key elements from that model because the model's based on standards of care um, and a model of good practice, gold standard. So the teams have an audit. We send them the audit, which again, we can share with you around and they put all their information. So things are either a yes or a no, a red or a green. So have you got the right professionals in the team? Have you got the right staffing levels? And there's a percentage on that. So it shows how much percentage of staffing you've got. So you can really see uh, impact of that. Um, all the different pathways. Do, have you got all the pathways we've suggested? Do you see patients for up to six months? Do you see ESD patients and non-ESD? Um, and do you see patients within 72 hours got self-referral? Have you got life after stroke services in your area? Have you got six month reviews? And importantly, are you entering on to SNAP? Because a lot of our areas weren't even registered. So again, that will give you at the bottom um, a compliance with the model. So obviously we want everyone to be 100%. So this really helps us now benchmark where all our different areas are in terms of um, the model. So the next slide. So this for me was about, so how does the models, um, what's commissioned, the first one I talked about, impact on the patient, how we're going to describe that to commissioners to really push transformation. So this here, this again is the audit from the teams and they record the average time from referral to triage, average time from referral to initial assessment and that's face to face, not just a telephone call. And then we've put in um, average weight from ESD to if they're passing on to a service because one of the problems was in our area for instance you could see an ESD team straight away and then the weight to pass on for continued rehabilitation after the six weeks was 273 days which isn't acceptable so but we had no way of showing that so on here that will show that um, the gap there and then there's also things around the assessments for the individual because some services on SNAP, it will say, yes, we're seeing them within one to three days, but then there's a wait for treatment to begin by the OT's physio. So this really maps out for us what's the impact. We're able to say that in the different areas and we're able to give an overview of um, our assessment time was between one day and 273 days around our area. It also highlighted, like Sarah said, gaps in nursing and psychologists where there wasn't those posts. So that's really a, a good slide if you want to um, see the impact of your current models. So the next slide. So then this is, is around the team. So we're looking at the team's performance here and how we could measure outcomes for, for the teams once they'd seen the patients. And there was a lot, I won't go into details, but we had some issues with the modified ranking scale um, on the SNAP reports, which says whether the community teams have, the patient has improved, stayed the same or deteriorated. But the problem was it's done at end of discharge from hospital and at the community discharge from the team. And so what's happened is what a patient's like at the hospital is different from when they hit home and they've got problems with activities of daily living. So it was showing more people deteriorating which what is what we didn't want when we're trying to prove the case uh, for funding for these teams. So now we've got our own section nine on SNAP for the community for GM only. And the teams fill in these. Um, they're all based on nice standards. And with, with a modified ranking, the Bartel index and the Nottingham ADL, we have a before and after measure. So we clearly know this is the impact and we, we're, st we're going to start to be able to show how many people improve, stay the same and deteriorate, which is a good outcome to use. And we've got standards here around other patients being assessed for anxiety, for mood, are we seeing them within 72 hours? Are they receiving psychology as part of the core team? Um, so all those different things there, we're, we're gonna be able to start um, adding to the reports about the outcomes uh, once the patient hits the team because the SNAP data at the minute is very limited for community. The other thing it's given us about the 45 minute of therapy is options. So where you don't give the patient 45 minute of therapy, it just says you haven't on SNAP. Whereas we've got options like, 
the patient declined or the patient was medically unwell and all the different reasons. So it's given us more um, subjective data around why that didn't happen, which again, we can use for further, further work. It's just worth saying, if you're not familiar with SNAP, that section nine, you can put things called custom fields in. So effectively, we've added in our own fields. And how we've got over that as a, as a region is that um, the ODN has got an information sharing agreement with all the trusts. So when, because SNAP don't actually do anything with that data for you, but there is a way around it. So the trusts download it, register as, as part of our uh, the teams. So they uh, upload the data and then they send it to Chris at the ODN and then he puts it all into these charts and then we're, we're working on now the format of, of, of how that report's going to look like so you can get over those challenges and again for the end of the pathway we're now looking at it's like Sarah mentioned yesterday six month refu reviews we've got a dashboard there which is going to be recording um, all the GM SAP questions from the review and producing charts and data about what actually are these reviews saying because I don't think nationally anywhere we're collecting that so that's the kind of final bit on the pathway for us and we're going to be able to do that across GM to see what the trends are and obviously in areas where we haven't got rehabilitation is there a difference so the final the next slide sorry so, yeah, so basically the key steps for me of how, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work and the key things, if you ask me, uh, would be the model. So collaborative, collaboratively, we've developed a model to work from. So we all know what kind of model of rehabilitation, like the acute uh, model, we've got one for community. So that's helping to benchmark. Um, we've agreed the measures, so all the outcome measures have been agreed involving the community teams themselves, very engaged, very involved. We've got the section nine now, so we're able to um, take the reports further and collect more data than traditionally on SNAP. Um, we've, again, like I said, we've worked with the trust audit departments to support um, the process with the ODM picking up um, that kind of data information, that team that you know really struggled to do that. So having that, that is really useful. Um, we carry out the snapshot audits about staffing twice a year. We're going to follow it in line with SNAP. So we continually know where our teams are up to. Um, the dashboard has been significant for the teams and for CCGs are really engaged. Sarah uses at all the strategic meetings to highlight where we are in the in terms of community because no commissioners like being in red and um, provided training for the teams and all the data the outcomes and the teams are between 75 to 90 percent compliance now with so it's just, there's a big thing around the odn supporting the teams with this as well around training um, and as i said using the dashboard to inform commissioners providers and the stp on the performance and it's really really driving our change in greater manchester so the next slide so this is what we look like now across all our areas we've had two new recent within the last four months investment brand new uh, million pound investment in these um, areas which are all working towards the service spec and the model as a clinical lead i help the commissioners with business cases around modeling so we know they're doing the right thing um, in the other areas we've had additional investments to get the teams to where uh, they are in terms of the model and that's all been around the dashboard because it shows you exactly where the gaps are and other areas you haven't got the new investment are in the business case development which as an ODM we support them again with using what resources they've got and uh, hopefully to get to new investments. So we really have moved from you know nothing to significant uh, developments in the community, all working to the same thing. Can I just add in one extra thing that we're doing that um, occurred to me that I hadn't put in the slides was the other thing we, we did uh, in 2016 and we're doing now is we're benchmarking ourselves for all clinical teams in patient and community against the RCP clinical guideline. So we're benchmarking just a simple do you fully meet each of the recommendations that are relevant to the team. We did it in 2016, we'll do it again, and it will be useful to do that again in two, two years' time, or depending on when, when the guideline next changes. So that will that will show us as well what um, the ability of teams to deliver 
um, the, the, the clinical guideline and, and hopefully as our services transform then the community seems who last time round were only about 75% compliant our, our inpatient units were about 90% plus it will be really good to see um, if the, the teams are able to deliver more because they're commissioned in the way that allows them to deliver the the elements of the of the guideline so that'll be something that we'll be able to add into the to the impact of transformation kind of a data set when we've got that data back after Christmas. Tracy, so uh, thank you very much indeed. I think we've just got your uh, contact details if people are wanting to follow up on particular <coughs> elements. Uh, thank you. Uh, as, as we did yesterday, uh, uh, webinars are not best suited for showing appreciation, but I think if we can just show appreciation wherever you are, on a train or <laughs> elsewhere, for our speakers. Thank you very much, Helen, Sarah, Tracy. Uh, a lovely uh, run through of some fantastic work. And it's, it's getting more and more annoying, I have to say, that you just about how good Manchester is at so many things. So if we you can know what the is, is you need a network, and that is the magic actually. Part of it is you need infrastructure to support this. Whether your strategic clinical network is now capable again of supporting you, because obviously since 2012 those have been run down, but having a network to in, in support is actually critical in all of this because it brings people together and it allows a, a focus on the program of work. So. Um, you know, I would say that because I run a network, but um, they do no, make yeah. a huge difference. And I do have, because I've worked for many years in, in community stroke rehabilitation. And, and believe it or not, this model that I've shown you now, as a jobbing OT when I set my first stroke team up, I was a poster at the UK Stroke Forum 12 years ago. <laughs> so that shows you how long things get to put into practice. Well, it's the average length of time, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Research and so the ODN, I think the ODN is very good, and I think the clinical, the clinical leadership, uh, together with the ODN, it, you know, it is really effective. But I think also that's what we lack at a national level is, is that community focus and leadership to yeah. drive a work program, basically of what we've been doing. If you had that nationally, um. You know that'd be a real drive and, and there's i get calls every single day from areas um you know sharing supporting um, which comes a bit much sometimes but so i think nationally um it Fantastic. would be to have this we need uh, to clear so, really and send around the country yeah yeah okay all right well um, any uh, suggestions for cloning machines i think we're all <laughs> those. Uh, Tracy and Sarah, thank you again. Uh, just to remind people how you can uh, join in the discussion, we'd love your reflections, comments, uh, what particularly resonated for you, any questions you have. Uh, again, those ways to do that are on your screen. Uh, I know we've got questions already starting to come through. We've got about a quarter of an hour or so for those, so please do send through. If you're watching later, probably the go-to, uh, the ask question features is going to be less useful, but of course, please do feel free to share uh, reflections by Twitter. Uh, that hashtag is New Era Stroke. Um, let's get straight on with Lydia. Questions? Thank you. Thanks, speakers. Um, so we have a question from Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, how did the team collate the data and how often do you collect it? And did you have any challenges with collecting it? Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, Tracy, Sarah. Yeah, so there's different elements to the dashboard to all the things I've shown you. So the on SNAP, they, they populate it as per their normal patient data. So the section nine, they complete once they've co completed the other sections. So that's quite easy once you you've got that on there and then for the dash for the modeling around the teams um sarah sends out a simple questionnaire they just fill it in and send it back and then as i said the benefit of the odn is they populate everything and then they'll send the report back to the teams to show them where they're at so the information is just given by the team and the odn facilitate that into the dashboard I mean, the snapshot audit that we do for the other elements outside section nine. I mean, I can't promise everybody emails back the next day, but we haven't had a haven't had a team not respond. It usually takes a bit of nagging in a few weeks, but um, and we've made the spreadsheet as simple as possible. It's pretty much yes, no, yes, no. It shouldn't take more than five minutes. And actually, most of it now is just looking at what you did last time and has there been any changes. There's often not, so it it may take you two minutes to complete. So. Um, that's what we've learned really you make it as easy as possible and teams are much more likely to, to be involved we've done a huge amount of work though with the community teams about engaging them 
why they're doing this because I think the inpatient teams see the benefit of SNAP because their chief execs see it and also they use the data to drive their own improvement. The data that traditionally went into SNAP is like vanishing into a black hole. So there's no incentive to do that because you don't get anything useful back from it. So we've worked quite hard to try and give the information back to them so that they can start using it from a service improvement um, perspective. So um, we obviously want to use it as a GM level and we keep telling them we're going to your commission. And of course they're seeing now that money is starting to be released. So we take the dashboards and they get money released, they get more staff. So we've done a lot of work saying it's in your interest to help us with this because if you, you stop moaning about the gaps, we won't, we won't fill the gaps unless you provide data to, to demonstrate what the problem is and then we can help find solutions. So there's a big engagement piece we've been doing for the last two and a half years that has made all the difference, I think. And we do training. So when we launch something in design, we 